And good morning, everyone. Welcome to another DigitalOcean Tech Talk. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Mason Egger, and I am a senior developer advocate here at DigitalOcean. So good morning, everyone. Hello to everyone in chat. We're going to just kind of sit here for a second. I'm going to say hi to all y'all. So if you're in chat, say hello. Tell me where you're coming in from. And we're going to get started in a few, well, let's say two, three-ish minutes to give everyone some time to drop in. So good morning. It is, what is today's date? It is Wednesday, December 8th. It is chilly in Texas today. A little bit chilly. It's supposed to be a high of 77 and sunny. These are the beautiful times of the year in Texas. Um, absolutely love it. So yeah. Hello everyone. Hi. Uh, Effendi and from Indonesia. Hey, Kenny coming in from Winnipeg. Uh, hey, Stefan, good to see you today. Morning texture from Hong Kong. It's good to see everyone in this morning. I should start preparing jokes for this. I feel like this opening segment because, like, whenever we start these tech talks. Like, I don't just jump into it because, like, the weird thing is, like, people get on YouTube and then they get an ad and I don't want to start. So I usually give everyone a couple minutes to get here. And I really should prepare this banter a little bit better. But as you can see, I'm just good at it by in general. So welcome, everyone. Morning, Tech. Morning, James from Canada. Wonder if it's... How cold is it in Canada right now? I don't know. My... I have my, my little brother lives in Seattle. He's visiting me now, but he lives in Seattle. And apparently it gets cold up there in the winter. In Texas, it's like 70 and it's fine. Like it was like 40 something this morning. It was a little bit chilly, but ugh, all that stuff can't deal with it. Uh, Tarek coming in from Lebanon. Welcome. Uh, Passport coming in from Florida. Nice to see you. Uh, Desharth, I hope I said that right. Coming in, saying hello. Uh, John, one of our DO sharks, telling me to have a great stream today. That's awesome. Good to see you, John. I also know that John is really, yeah, working with him in PDOC stuff. Really enjoy working with John. I don't know where I was going with that. My brain had a moment. It does that sometimes. Johnny the Pirate from Poland. Uh, some a LinkedIn user from Indonesia coming in. Rohan saying, good night from India. Yes, it's always, it's always, uh, Time zones, time zones, and the fact that other people live in different parts like good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, good whatever. I don't know. Um, James says it's 23 and snowing. That's a big old nope from me. Um, that'll be a no from me. Like, I wouldn't turn around my chair on the voice for that. Uh, role is developer, but also does some CTO work. Awesome, Stefan. Negative five in Canada. I'm hoping that is in Celsius and not Fahrenheit. Um, which, yeah, that looks like that translates roughly. Because I think isn't zero in Celsius, 32 in Fahrenheit. We're Amer Yeah, we're American. We use that, Im that imperial system that no one else uses. Uh, greetings from Bangladesh and from India. Middle Minnesota. I bet it is cold there. Um, about dinner time there. Hello from Egypt. Well, hello. India. Uh, gray and rainy South Carolina. That's that, you know, everyone I've ever heard has talked about that. So, okay. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So today we're going to go ahead and talk about load balancers, specifically how to load balance your high traffic sites. Uh, again, for those of you that are just coming in and don't know me, my name is Mason Egger. I am a senior developer advocate here at DigitalOcean. You can follow me at Twitter, uh, at Mason Egger. If you have any questions, um, feel free to drop your questions in the chat live. I like going through questions live in chat, um, but I guarantee you I won't get through everything today. So feel free to just tweet at me or if you like spicy hot takes, sometimes I do those on Twitter too. Um, you can view my website and write, view the deranged writings that I have, all sorts of fun stuff. So today's goals, um, we're going to talk just like we're going to do an overview of load balancers. What is a load balancer? How do they benefit you? Why do we need load balancers? Um, we're going to talk about digital ocean load balancers in general. Um, this tech talk is partially being done. The fact that we just had a release with our load balancers, um, where we increased a whole bunch of like a lot of new features, a lot of cool things coming out. So this is kind of like a, it's a tech talk on load balancers. But it's also kind of a sm smaller, uh, let, Hey, look at all the new stuff we're doing. You know, a lot of cool stuff going on at DO right now. We're going to do a demo on load balancing droplets. So we're going to go like from zero to hundred on deploying droplets, getting stuff set up, load balancing them on DO, set up with SSL uh, termination, all of that. 
So load balance across three. Yeah, I just said that. Um, we're going to deploy an app to App Platform and discuss how App Platform does load balancing. So for those of you that are unaware, App Platform is our platform as a service style thing. Um, and it will allow us to just deploy our code instead of doing traditional server stuff. And we're going to talk about how you can use load balancers on DigitalOcean Kubernetes. Um, we're not going to have time to get into a full demo on Kubernetes, uh, mostly because just timing and also it just it takes a while. And also, I'm not that great at Kubernetes. Um, maybe next year, maybe next year, we'll do a more in-depth load balancing Kubernetes talk. And we're, I'll do one with my coworkers. But we're going to talk about how you would do it. And I'll show you the product docs and send you some of the documentation pages. But we're not going to be able to demo that one today. OK, so here we go. We already have a question in the chat. And that's a great question. Um, currently, I believe the answer to this is no. You cannot set load balancers for droplets in different regions. Um, not with DigitalOcean load balancers. If you were to use maybe a third-party service such as Cloudflare and do a Cloudflare load balancer, you could probably do this. But DO load balancers, the droplet has to be specifically within the region that the load balancer is in. So great question. Uh, yes. So let's talk about what is a load balancer. Um, load balancers basically are a piece of hardware or software. There's software-defined load balancers and hardware-defined load balancers. Um, and they distribute traffic across a group of resources. This allows you to decouple uh, the health of your service from a single server. And it also helps ensure that your services stay online. So, you know, we can do deploy a server. Say I deploy a blog on a droplet, simple VM. Um, if I just have that server and something goes down, then my entire site is down. But if I deploy multiple of these, like just, it's a, I have a static site blog, which um, I use Hugo to generate. You can do this with dynamic apps as well, but for simplicity's sake, static site blog, you know, I can deploy the exact same thing on different servers. No one would know. And then load balancer will send it like basically in a round robin style. Number one gets it. Number two gets it. Number three gets it back up to the top. This will ensure that not one server gets all the traffic. And if one of those uh, droplets goes down, the load balancer very quickly figures out that that droplet is down and stops sending traffic to it. So your site doesn't really go down. So a load balancer really comes into play here. Whenever you move out of that phase of like, okay, this is my side project, this is my pet project, into I need reliability. Um, personally, my personal blog site, like if I had to, when I used to run it on a droplet, it was never behind a load balancer because it was my personal blog and the three people that read it, if it went down, they would tweet at me and I would fix it. However, if I'm running a business, if I'm, you know, running an e-commerce site, or maybe I'm my, my static site's a little bit more important, like maybe it's my homepage for my website, maybe I run a tire shop, and I want to make sure that people can always go to it, and, you know, servers get sick, things happen, then it's beneficial there to have a load balancer, because we definitely don't want people not to be able to visit our site if our site is, you know, part of our revenue, or it's a high important site. So that's where load balancers really come in with that. Um, what is the benefit you get from load balancers? Like we kind of covered this, but we'll cover it again just to uh, drive the point home. Um, load balancers just help you ensure that your service stays online when your servers are overloaded or when your servers are sick. Um, so that is a thing. Um, yeah, so that just allows you to, again, make sure that your service is online. It's all about uptime and then mitigating uh, traffic. So it also helps distribute the load, you know, with a static site, just serving, it's not going to be that much. But if you have a dynamic site underneath and it's doing a lot of computational resources and it's getting all of the traffic, it could get bogged down. One of the ways is to add more servers and then load balance it. This is what is known as scaling horizontally. Um, for anyone who's ever heard of these terms, horizontal and vertical scaling, horizontal scaling is when you add more workers to something. So for example, say I have, I'm a moving company. And I have this really big couch that I need to move. And I have a small, we'll say fifth grader, okay? They're about meh big and about meh wide. Um, not a lot of upper body strength. They're in fifth grade. You can't really blame them. We'll say 14-year-olds. Get 13, 14, 12-year-olds. I don't know what the age limit is for that. One of them probably can't move a heavy couch. But if we get 10 of them together, they can probably pick up the couch and move it. And that is horizontal scaling, where we just add more of similar sized resources to come in, pick them up. Now we could do different sizes, but most of the time it's 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 similar size. Now, if we were talking about vertical scaling, for example, same couch, but instead of asking the fifth grader to do it, we go get a bodybuilder or a strongman or someone who you know lifts very heavy things for a living. They can probably move it themselves. That is when you take a server and you add more resources 
to the server. So if we had a one gigabyte, one CPU um, droplet, we could we would resize that into maybe an eight gigabyte, eight CPU droplet. A lot more resources can probably handle the load a lot better. So if you've ever been curious about the difference between the types of scaling, those are the, the, those they are. Load balancers specifically tackle the horizontal scaling problem. Okay, looking over at chat, we have another question from Rohan. Can you see a future uh, in the load balance different regions? Um, I don't know of anything on I, I don't know of anything on the roadmap on this. And honestly, I, if I did, I wouldn't be able to tell you. But I can 100% say I will take this to our the PM, the, pro, the the product manager for this. He and I are pretty good friends. And I will say this is a request that we have. So yes, if you have requests for this, um, and he may be lurking in the chat somewhere. He does that sometimes. Um, yeah, I will take this uh, stuff back and I will, you know, advocate for you to be able to get this. Um, yeah, I have no idea of it being on our product roadmap at this time. And unfortunately, even if I did, I couldn't tell you. So sorry about that. But no, the official answer is no. And in reality, I actually don't know. I haven't heard anything about that. Um, so DigitalOcean load balancers. Let's talk about load balancers. Uh, why? Okay, great question. Why does one decide to scale horizontally versus vertically? This is a great question. So sometimes your resources, well, it, there, there's a lot of reasons in the cloud. One could be cost. Um, so adding adding another five two more five dollar droplets might be cheaper than adding a larger droplet. Um. So that might be a reason to scale horizontally. Also, when you scale horizontally, it gives you redundancy. So instead of having three servers, now we have 100 of them running. We're a little bit more redundant. If we had three servers and we scaled them all up to 64 cores, um, it wouldn't, it, it, you're still at the same level of redundancy. Like you still have three, which means you can have a critical failure of like three before something happens. A critical failure of three happens in coding all the time. Um, another reason is, is not all software is architected to take advantage of high memory, high, uh, CPU stuff. Some software, some programs won't benefit like some pieces of software. It depends on how you write it. So it's your software. If you're not writing multi-threaded code and you're not running it in a multi-threaded way, adding more than one, uh, core doesn't benefit you in any way, shape or form. Like if you're running one instance of say a Python app, let's do that. Let's say you're running one instance of a Python app and you're using, like, and you're not using G Unicorn or some sort of uh, WSGI or ASGI service to create multiple processes, then no matter how many threads you throw at that, because of Python's global interpreter lock, it's stuck behind one thread. So you'd have one thread working really hard and seven threads doing nothing. It wouldn't benefit you at all. Um, very, like, in writing code that can actually take advantage of full multi processing is pretty tough. Um, now we have tools around that. Like usually your web server does try to take advantage of it. It tries to do requests across, uh, both Apache and Nginx are very good at this, but it could become a problem behind on your, your end that it just doesn't work that way. So having more would be, could be a one beneficial thing. Um, but sometimes it does make sense to scale up. So if you're talking about say like a Java app, the JVM heap fills up pretty quickly and can definitely sometimes be problematic. Um, so if you're seeing performance issues because like they, like there's too many people hitting the server and like, you know, we'll say a thousand requests and you're seeing like you're seeing out of memory errors popping up in your logs and stuff, horizontal scaling could would fix that problem, but it may also be wise to scale up and just give it some more space. Certain programming languages deal with things differently. Java, Ruby, very memory and resource intensive. Um, well, not very, but more so than some. The, the, the JVM can take up some space um, again, depending on how you've implemented your code, we used to have this problem at my previous job all the time is every now and then the JVM would run out of memory. And one of the options we had for that was just to kick the server and give it some more memory. Um, but yeah, that that can happen sometimes. So I would say personally, horizontally is when you want to add a little bit more redundancy and you know, you're already set up to go and you know that it's just going to work. Like it's running fine on $6 droplet. Hey, let's go with it. Let's move it up. Uh, vertically typically is like you're seeing you're seeing out of memory errors you're seeing um res complete resource uh like de like degradation like your like your memory your cpus are sitting at 900% like okay now we might we might want to consider scaling up here um yeah both work both can achieve the problem you kind of have to play it at eye level and just kind of figure out yeah 
Um, okay, another great question. Does do load balancers provide DDoS protection? That's a depends. Depends on how big the DDoS attack is. Probably, I would say probably not. Um, so if you have someone who, so say you have a web service that has, your you, your web service can handle a thousand requests per second. And someone is DDoSing you um, with a thousand and one requests per second. Okay, obviously adding the load balance, you'd actually have to scale up your load balancer because this might be a, a limitation on the load balancer. If you can scale up the load balancer and then scale the services underneath it where you can distribute it, yes, in theory, you could. Now, the problem is, is usually DDoS attacks are huge um, and they have they're a, they're a, they have a sneaky way of lingering. So I feel like you could you could attempt to outrun small DDoS attacks with load balancers. Um, but at that point, your best bet is using something like Cloudflare or, you know, maybe if you're notice you're getting a lot of attacks from the same IP range, banning an IP range for a period amount of times. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that it really, if it's a very small DDoS attack, like if, if I, I wouldn't even call it DDoS, then if it was a DOS attack, because DDoS implies dynamic and it implies huge. If it was really small, yeah, you could distribute the DOS attack and maybe mitigate it, but I wouldn't say... If I was being DDoSed, that would not, my first reaction would not be to try to load balance it away. My first reaction would probably be to use something like Cloudflare DDoS protection or start banning IP ranges that I know are hitting me really hard. Um, I could see adding more, scaling horizontally as an intermediary to try to keep the service up. Like that's when you're panicking and you're screaming and you're like more, like more, like shoveling, you're shoveling water out of a boat at that time and you're trying to get it out as quickly as you can. Another bucket's going to help, but you have a bigger problem. That's a gut leak in your boat. The metaphors are flowing very well today. Um, and I love that. Yes, many CDNs have built-in protection for DOS. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff around it. I would not classify load balancers as a top uh, thing around that. So around mitigating DDoS attacks. Uh, there are much better tools. You can try to outrun them, but honestly, that's going to cost you some money. So... Um, Yes, DigitalOcean load balancers. These have been great questions. Uh, another great question. Does DigitalOcean have a CDN offering? Yes, it's called Spaces. DigitalOcean Spaces. You can just deploy. It's our S3 equivalent. Um, and basically, so it, it, you, it has an S3 compatible API. It's an object storage. And there's a, a button or a check, an option you can set when you're setting up your spaces to globally distribute it as a CDN. So yes, DigitalOcean offers a CDN offering. It's or object storage CDN offering and it's known as Spaces. I am loving the questions today. These are great questions. Okay. DigitalOcean load balancers. I'm going to stop answering questions for a second, and then I'll come back to them as I get to them later. Because um, we, we have to get these droplets deployed. So DigitalOcean offers load balancers for your compute needs. Um, they're compatible currently with droplets and Kubernetes. Um, if you're familiar with App Platform, App Platform apps are currently load balanced, but they're not load balanced with our load balanced product. They're done a different way. So you can load balance that platform, but if you go to digitalocean.com, go into the cloud console and click on load balancers, you really don't have an option for app platform at that moment, at that time. So don't worry about that. Um, load balancers are scalable nodes on DigitalOcean that allow you to have more fine grain access. So this kind of goes into like, what is a load balancer? Um, load balancers can be hardware. They can be like just a hardware compute. That's entire job is that, or they can be software defined and I believe ours are kind of a mixture of the both. But either way, you will DigitalOcean allows you to do is it allows you to provide load balancer nodes. So we've actually recently changed this. If you've followed the load balancer progress through DigitalOcean's history, um, we first start off with just load balancer. It balanced your load, and that was it. And then uh not that long ago, I don't say six, eight, maybe ten months ago, we released a, where you had small, medium, and large load balancers that allowed you to scale. You know, like this one does 10,000, this one does 30,000 requests per second, and this one does 50. Um, and it allowed you to kind of have a little bit more flexibility with it. And now the latest iteration of our load balancing product is this one that allows you to have nodes. So every load balancer is a set of nodes now, a set of load balancing nodes. Um, each node does 10,000 requests per second. It has 10,000 simultaneous connections per second. And it allows for 255 new SSL connections per second. Um, each one of these. now. I, there was some, whenever we first released this, people were like, oh, that seems, this is exactly how it's always been. Um, so if, like, it's just, maybe it wasn't as broadcast as well, but this is this, like a small load balancer was exactly this. And now 
what we can do to it is you can add up to a hundred nodes. So now you can uh, load balance up to a million requests per second. And I think that's what 25,000 and new SSL connections per second, if you add two zeros to that. Yes. So you start off with one and you can scale all the way to hundred. Each one just adds more functionality. I think it's really cool. I love this scalable architecture. When, when the PM originally told me about these plans, it's like, oh, people are going to love this. It's really cool. So now you can have, you can have more fine grain control. So if you just need 10,000 per sec per second, um, and 250 new connections per second, again, that's new because remember SSL takes time to like, SSL is an expensive operation. And by expensive, I mean like compute cycles, not dollar signs. Um, it takes a bit to do that. So this is pretty typical. Um, but most of that overhead happens at the top. So anyway, um, you can go ahead and do this and add these, add these and you can just expand as you need to and you can scale down as you need to. Um, you can scale up or down at any time. Uh, once per hour is your limit at this moment. I'm talking with them on getting that um, looked at, but right now, every once every hour, you can scale up to a or down to a different number of load balancers, uh, load balancer nodes. Um, it also supports managing your Let's Encrypt certificates for you, especially if you're trying to do SSL termination. They support SSL pass through. There's a whole bunch of really cool stuff for it. So, let's go ahead and get into the demo today. So we're going to have this load balancer demo. We're going to set up three droplets running Nginx uh, displaying their host names so we can see the round robin happening. We're going to create a load balancer and add it and point it to the droplets. We're going to add a DNS name to the load balancer and we're going to use Let's Encrypt to uh, do an SSL termination. So let's start off. We're in the right project. Let's go ahead and go to this. And these slides will be available um, after this inside of my the Tech Talk page, which we will post at the very end. So what we're going to do quickly is we're just going to create three droplets that kind of show us um, so we can, so we have something to load balance. So we're going to click on this $6 droplet, the premium Intel AMD and NVMe SSDs. I love these personally. That extra dollar is so worth it. These, these, these things are smoking fast. Um, we're going to put it in SFO3 just because that's where I feel like putting it today, SSH keys. But what we're going to do is we're going to use user data. So this is going to be a quick little detour for me to be able to teach you about user data. If you've never used user data before, you're kind of missing out uh, for provisioning. User data is a way for you to send cloud init data or just raw bash to your droplet that will be executed at the time that it's created. So we have a doc here that's how to provide user data. Um, and this right here will allow us to basically install Nginx and then add our droplet name and our public IP address. So we can see when we go to the default Nginx page, it'll just say our name and our IP address. So if we go here, we're going to do that. Now, this code is a little out of date. I just submitted a PR to fix it. You have to change that line from user share Nginx to var www.html index.html. Um, and also, because I haven't, been enjoying this as much we're going to try this and hopefully it doesn't break anything you know what no we're not we're not going to do that this works i didn't test it we're not going to do it i wanted to make it a little bit bigger but we don't need to uh and then i'm just going to come over here and i'm going to do lb-tech-talk01 we're going to add three droplets here and we're going to add the tech talk tag to these so let's just go over that again real quick we're creating three droplets three ubuntu 2004 droplets we're going to use this user data to just basically install Nginx. And then this is the public, or this is the uh, internal API that is available to all droplets so I can get my host name and get my IPv4 address. We're going to echo that just directly to the var www Nginx, or, or in, var www in the HTML index.html. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then SSH keys, Sammy, load balancer, we're going to click create. So this will create three droplets for us. This will take a little bit of time. So if there's any questions, so there's going to be a couple points in the sh in, in the in the program today where we're going to be waiting on some deployments. So if anyone has any questions, now's a great time to ask them um, because there's going to be like two or three sections where we're going to be waiting on um, deployment. So if you have questions, please drop them in the chat and I will answer them as we wait on these to provision because not only do they have to provision, they also then have to install Nginx and do the code that it's in there. So um, any questions? We'll say hello to Celine, who is saying hello from Denver. Hello from Denver. I have a lot of coworkers in Colorado. A lot of them. Like every everyone is in Colorado. I don't know why. 
Do I recommend any load generation tools? I'm a little confused uh, on what a load generation tool is. Like, are you talking about like something to test it so you can like do testing on it, like generate fake load for testing purposes? Um, the only things I can think of right now are Chaos Monkey and Toxy Proxy, but I've never actually used them. I've just been adjacent to teams that were using them. Um, Another question, can we load balance via IPv6 or IPv4, or will it be using the private EIPv4 for load balancing? So we can currently only load balance across IPv4. Um, and then, yes, you're right. So every droplet that is created now is created inside of a VPC, and so will the load balancer. They're all in your default, or you can put them somewhere else. And the load balancing that happens between the load balancer to the droplet is happening on the private interface inside of the VPC. So though the load balancing coming in will be across IPv4, but I think we only accept IPv4 coming in um, I, again, will ask the PM, the product manager, about if IPv6 is on the roadmap. Um, can the DigitalOcean load balancer operate in front of DigitalOcean managed databases? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure. I don't know. I don't, I, it's, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I'll, I will look that up, and whenever we send out our follow-up email, I will, um, we will answer that. I don't know. I've never tried it. I don't know if they have it built in or not. Um, the managed databases have a lot of stuff built in, and I've never really uh, tried that. So it seems like people are saying like Apache, Apache Bench or Apache JMeter uh, for these fake user kind of data. That's cool. I've never actually tried doing that, and I'll have to look into that as well. Um, but awesome. We have our droplets up. So if we just go and click on the copy here and we run it, now it's, like, it's a little bit small, but you can see we have... Uh, just that. There's nothing, nothing to happen when we refresh it because it's not going to do anything. So now let's create a load balancer. So we go over here and we click load balancers. Also, all of this is available via the API and via Terraform. If you've ever watched any of my past Terraform talks, I did this exact same thing, but in Terraform. Um, so we're going to go ahead and choose our San Francisco region because we have three droplets in that region. Um, we're going to do one node. Um, we don't really need more, but as you can see, as I click up, the node price goes up. Also, I forgot to mention each LB node is $10 a month. So, I mean, you could spend a lot on it if you got the full 100. Um, yeah, thousand dollars a month. If you got a hundred and you needed that, but like one a month, $10, one, $10 a month. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to connect this to our, we can connect it to individual droplets, but we can also connect it to things that have the tags on them. So we're just gonna say tech talk tag. We're gonna forward 80 to 80, simple as that. And we're not gonna do any advanced settings. So we're gonna go ahead and just click create load balancer. This one actually does take a little time, unfortunately. So if, again, if there's any questions, please feel free to uh, ask them in the chat because this one will take a little bit of time. I'm trying to think if there's something we can do while we're waiting on it. Um, mm, I guess I could just talk about the next part. Yeah, we'll talk about the next, what we're going to do next, and then we'll, unless I see some questions come in. Um, but so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add DNS to a load balancer, and then we're going to do SSL termination. So for those of you that aren't aware of SSL termination, there's there's two different ways that your your load balancer can handle SSL. So there's what's known as termination and there's what's known as pass through. So SSL pass through is as simple as it sounds. It literally just takes the request and forwards it straight to the server. Um, this is a, this can be a little bit complex in some ways because you then you have to manage SSL certs, the same SSL cert across multiple um, droplets. So if you had, say I had those three droplets and they were all masonegger.com, um, I would have to manage that cert across all of them, which wouldn't be terribly difficult. I think I could just do it on one and then copy it to the others. Um, but it also puts the burden of decrypting the SSL to your droplet. And remember, if you mentioned, if you remember how I mentioned earlier, SSL like connections are not a quote unquote cheap uh, operation. They take CPU cycles. Anything cryptographic takes compute cycles, and we usually don't do too much like investigation into like how bad is, is SSL making my performance um, because it's a necessary thing. Like we just have to live with it, but sometimes you can, but when you're doing SSL pass through, it just goes straight through and then the droplet handles it. 
Um, personally, I don't, I don't, I don't do that one that much. I use termination, which means that the load balancer level decrypts it, and then it talks basically across plain HTTP on the back end, and your your servers, your droplets don't even know that they are dealing with SSL. This allows you to take all of that complexity, put it on the load balancer. It also means that we only have to do one certificate. It's on the load balancer, and then the load balancer renews that, and then that's what is in control of everything. So that's one way to do it. And I think it's a pretty good way, um, and that's what we're going to demo today. Let's look and see if we have any... Uh, things. So yes, we have a question here. Do you have to define what ports to load balance? Yes, you do. For now, we're I'm demoing HTTP load balancing, and then we're going to do HTTPS at the end, and we'll change it. But yes, you have to define the ports, um, and we'll go over that again. It was in the creation, but we'll go over that again. Um, and then question. For managed databases, does DO offer replicas, read replicas, and failover? Yes. Yes and yes. Um, Go to the data, DigitalOcean database product documentation and um, you'll be able to read about it there. And for, let's see where we're at with the load balancer. I might be able to talk about it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to move forward. Yeah. I'm going to, well, here, we'll just do DigitalOcean databases product docs. I'll pull that up for you real quick. Manage databases. Um, where is it at? It's going to be in Postgres. Yeah, single node clusters, high availability, read only. So I'll, this is just for Postgres. You'd have to click on the individual one. I'll drop it in the chat. But yes, DigitalOcean does offer all of that. Uh, so we have our load balancer. We have our load balancer. There it is. We found it. Wrong tabs. Um, and now we have a public IP address for our load balancer. So if we come here and we go to our public IP, we'll see our load balancer. We'll see it. And then as we refresh... We'll see that our host name and our IP address is changing because we're actively load balancing across the droplets. And as you can see, sometimes the hard refresh doesn't always take, I guess, probably some caching. Um, so, yeah, you have all of that. And then what we're going to do now is we're going to add a DNS name to it. I keep clicking. I'm going to click through all the tabs until I get there. So let's go ahead and add a DNS name. So we're going to go ahead and go to, I have a domain already in DO. So one thing is if you want DO to manage your Let's Encrypt certificates, you have to use DigitalOcean DNS to do it. So like, and basically all you do is you buy your domain name on a registrar and we manage DNS. We're not a domain registrar. You cannot purchase domains from us, but you can just point your name servers at us and boom, you're ready to go. So I, what we're going to do is we're going to call this techtalk.sammy.cloud and we're going to redirect this to our San Francisco 3 load balancer, which we could have gave it a better name, but I, I didn't. So we're going to go ahead and create that record. And we called it techtalk.sammy.cloud. Hopefully, DNS usually propagates pretty quickly, but it might fail on us here for a second. Nope, we got it. So now we have DNS working. Um, and once we have that, uh, we can go ahead over here to our control panel. And let's go ahead and add... Let's finish this, this demo off with some SSL certificates. So we go to the load balancer and we go to settings. And unfortunately, in my opinion, this setup, you have to do the, the name first, or at least you used to. And it, this is a little bit of a confusing UI experience. Personally, I you do this in Terraform. It makes brilliant sense in Terraform and it's super easy. And I will pull up the Terraform code in a second and show you because I think I have some somewhere. So what we're going to do is we're going to change our forwarding rule to HTTPS. And as you can see, when we do that, it go ahead and says, hey, you need to do a certificate. Um, and it is, allows you to just do a straight pass through. This test one was my certificate from earlier. But let's go ahead and say a new certificate. And then we have to search for the domain that we have registered in DigitalOcean. Now, what we can do is our DigitalOcean does support wildcard domains. So you could just do... A, in a wildcard domain, which I don't really want to do right now, we're going to specify a, select a specific subdomain here, which means we're going to say, hey, techtalk.sammy.cloud, that's the one I want to do. And we just call it techtalk. And we're going to click generate certificate. And when we click generate certificate here, it's going to create it. It takes a little bit of time. The other thing I want to do um, is SSL redirect. I want to change. Oh, well, first we have to click save here. Um, create DNS records for all new Let's Encrypt certificates. I'm going to uncheck that because I already did it. So the, this used to not be here, which means maybe we do it for you now, which would be pretty cool. I need to test that. Um, very rarely do I ever use the UI for this. I'm usually doing this through Terraform. Um, 
and it's super simple in Terraform. So the other thing we have is we can select SSL and we're going to say, hey, redirect all of our HTTP to HTTPS and we click save. This should be done on everything. It is 2021, almost 2022. There is no need for unsecure internet traffic. Please put your stuff behind SSL. Um, a couple of other options that we have here. So if we wanted to click resize, again, we can't do it because we're within an hour, but we can easily just resize to whatever we want. If I try to update it now, it's going to say no, because you uh, can't resize. It hasn't been an hour yet. This is the time in which you can do your next resize. Um, we have our forwarding rules set up. We have health checks. So the load balancer, this is how often the load balancer checks to see if a droplet is still available. You know, we can we can really mess up a drop. We can mess this up because, you know, the load balancer is supposed to detect when things are down and continue to distribute to them. Um, so, yeah, you can do this across whatever port you want. You can set your health check timeout as much as you want. Sticky sessions are pretty cool, but basically this uh, adds a cookie that allows you to make sure that you get back to the same droplet that you have established a connection with. This is stripped off at the LB level, so you really can't even see this on the user side. This is more for us, but it's a cool thing to use. I've never really messed with it. Uh, proxy protocol, you can do some proxy stuff. You can do a backend keep alive. But yes, so if we go now, that should have been enough time for the certificate to be created. If I click refresh here, is it going to automatically try to do HTTPS? I try to do HTTP again. Uh, sometimes that uh, redirect takes a minute. But now you can see we have our secure connection by doing HTTPS. And I'm pretty sure if I just went to it without my browser caching it, it would automatically go to it now. But as you saw, the HTTP didn't work. It'll probably redirect once my browser cache is fixed. And now we have SSL. So that's droplets for this. I'm going to demo one more thing. We're going to destroy one of these droplets because I literally saw a question in here about what happens if three isn't enough. But one of the things we can do is we'll just destroy this droplet. And we click in the load balancer. Oh, drat. I did it the wrong way. The load balancer is really smart. It knows. It knows that there's nothing there anymore. Okay. So let's do this a sneakier way. Let's go here. Let's SSH in. Root at. System CTL stop Nginx. Okay, so now one of these has a down web service, so you would wonder what's going to happen. Okay, so it's going to say service 503 unavailable, and it's going to do this for a little bit because it's going to take a bit of time for it to figure it out. But, okay, are we there? It has to go through that health check. So we defined how many of those health checks it is. I think with based on what we did, we defined it at, what do we define it at? So check in 10 intervals, response, timeout, five seconds, unhealthy threshold three. So about 30 seconds is what it's currently checked to check at. Um, and that's when it will de basically determine that it has uh, no longer. Yes. So now I can press this as many times as I want. The load balancer has already determined that that, that, that site is down and it's not going to, it's no longer routing traffic to it. Now, sometimes it takes a little bit of time in here for this to update, but so... The UI can be sometimes be a little bit behind. I've noticed personally of no, noting it, but the load balancer itself, it knows, and it's not sending us tra sending us there anymore because it knows that that droplet is down. Awesome. So that is load balancing droplets. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to keep going, and I'm, we're going to talk about load balancing app platform apps. We're going to deploy an app to app platform that usually takes a good amount of time just be, with first deploy and stuff. And that's why I'm going to go back to all of your questions. So pl I've seen there's a lot of good questions coming in. Pl dump, please keep dumping them in the chat. I will answer them as soon as we get through this next segment um, because we're going to have a lot of downtime. Wait, or not a lot of downtime, but we'll have more downtime at that. So that's how we do it at the droplet level. But not everyone wants to use droplets. Other people want to use things like app platform or something like that. So we have this code on GitHub. If this is a This is forked from the sample Flask app. It is a simple Python app with one line. And basically, I import the socket library class. We'll just zoom this in a little bit so you can see it. It's a little bit small. And we're just going to get the host name, and we're going to print the host name. Um, this way, again, this is just so we can demonstrate that we're actually on different hosts. So let's go back to this, and let's go and create a new app. This code, by the way, if you want to play with it, is at masonegger-demos slash show-hostname-app. Because, again, I'm great at naming things. We go to GitHub here. We wait for the Sandy Shark to swim. 
sometimes it takes longer than others. Also, there's a lot of stuff like in this thing, so it probably takes a bit for that. Uh, show host name app. We won't do a branch made. We're going to main, sorry. We're going to automatically code deploy changes. We click next. Then we take these web services. We have our G unicorn. So this is already built in uh, into our stuff. It detects that it's a Flask app and it's like, hey, we kind of think we know what you want. In this instance, it's correct. We're going to use G unicorn as a WSGI port 8080. Uh, pretty standard, straightforward Python stuff. This can be done with anything. I'm just using Python as a demo language. Any programming language can do this. We're going to give it a name and a region. And then we're going to, the only way to get horizontal scaling in app platform is to do a pro plan. So, and then you would have to have a certain number of containers. So this is if you really want high availability in a, in a, in a, in a, um, in your app platform app. So we're going to add three of them, which I mean, they're 12 bucks a month. So it's a little bit pricey. Again, this is like for production workloads or like near production workloads. You, you really want this horizontal scaling. Um, and we're going to click launch pro app. And when this is done, like it's going to go, it's going to have all this progress bar. So we're going to wait on it. And when it's done, we will demo it. But that means now that I can uh, go and answer your questions. So where was the question? Okay, so first question is from Varun. Um, what happens if three droplets are not sufficient to balance the load? So what if what basically what will happen here is you will see that your CPU usage on stuff. Um, let's go back to that. Let's see what we can see. I've never I've never really looked at the control panel for load balancers. Um, as you can see, the load balancer has detected it, that that one is down graphs. So we'll be able to see like, you know, the amount of responses, load balancer, super, load balancer, CPU utilization and all of that. So if you're starting to see that that's not enough, you're going to see degradation in your website. You're going to see requests not getting served, things timing out. You're going to see high CPU percentages, probably. You're going to see high RAM percentages, probably. If three are not enough, add more. Like, you have to deploy more droplets. You have to deploy in the right way. Um, like, the same setup uh, and go with that. And that's what you would have to do to get these to work again. So if three are not enough, add more. Um, next question. Are there tools available to replicate across droplets underneath LLB once a change has been made to the master drop? Okay. Ooh, that's a great question. Um, are there any DO tools? No. Are there advanced DevOps tools that do this? Yes. If you go back to my previous tech talk where I talked about Packer, which is um, a tool that you use to provision droplet images. So if you need to be able to do this, you can use a tool called Packer. It's a HashiCorp product, uh, P-A-C-K-E-R. Um, really awesome. I, if you look at our YouTube channel, you'll see literally my last tech talk last month was on this topic, using Packer and Ansible to provision a droplet. So you would use these automation tools to create a, what we call a golden image. It's the image that works. And then it would upload it to DigitalOcean as a custom droplet image. Um, usually you use a base. So like it's based off the Ubuntu one. It does all the my base install stuff. And then it goes, you would then up, it would upload to DO. And then you would just click deploy on it again and make sure it's within like the right tag and the right VPC and the right region and all that. And it would just go. Um, now, if you're asking, is there a tool that like, say I have a droplet and I change it and then it immediately replicates um, that's called rsync. Uh, it works with rsync. I don't know of any advanced tooling that does it. That's really hard. That's, that's not really hard to do. That's complicated. So you're kind of better off either baking a golden image or using a configuration management tool, something like Ansible, Salt, Chef, Puppet, where you make a change, a programmatic change, and it applies to all of them. So configuration management tools here will work. Baking a golden image will work. If you're just changing files, you can technically do an rsync across them um, and get all that to work. So those are kind of like, those are three good options. There's probably a lot more. Um, I would probably start with the Packer one personally. I, I used to be really big into config management tools and they are amazing. Um, I would use Packer. I would bake new golden images. I would give them a new name. So like say I had version one of my software across three droplets and I want to get to version two. Um, I could use Ansible, use something like Ansible or Salt to just push version two. Um, I could also just bake a new golden image, test it, make sure it's working with version two, deploy those three, three new droplets of version two alongside the other one. So it'd be six droplets, which means you would get like an A-B testing, a blue-green deployment where half your traffic would go to the new one, half your traffic would go to the old one. 
once I was positive that the new traffic was fine, I would just literally delete the old ones, and then you're stuck with your left with your new ones. This is kind of how we used to roll out stuff at, uh, at my last job, um, is you know slowly rolling out the new changes and, and slowly decreasing the old ones. That's an option. When is DN DigitalOcean DNS going to support DNSSEC? I will ask. Um, DNSSEC is a really cool tool, but it's also... Um, one, extremely complicated. Two, usually causes most of your outages. And three, not a lot of people use it. Or a lot of people use it, but like it's a very complicated tool. So if you read the, the Slack outage that happened in September, they released their postmortem. It was DNSSEC. Um, that's what caused it. And whenever you mess up with DNSSEC, you get to let it propagate and it takes forever to fix. So a lot of great questions today. Let's go back to our apps. I'm going to just check and see where we're at with this app. And then I'm going to continue asking questions. Or answering questions. Okay, we're still waiting on it. So, uh, can you set up auto scaling and/or remove droplets in flight? Currently, DigitalOcean does not offer auto scaling purposes. Um, it is a highly requested feature, and it is something that I bug product about all the time. So, you can guarantee that I am advocating for you to make sure you have it. Um, you could set up your own auto scaling, like if you had like some sort of monitoring alert tool, and then you have everything that's being done uh, via, like everything can be done via an API. So you could have your own tool and whenever it gets to a certain point, you could fire an API call and do it. So you can build your own. DigitalOcean doesn't currently have any, but I I am I am constantly asking for that feature. It's my, it's my last feature. When I came to DO, I had three features that I wanted. Um, one is done, one is in the progress, and this one is the one that I'm trying to get. Like, so like if I feel like if I can get these three done, um, I will be happy and I, I can't tell you any more than that, but I will, I will continue to advocate for that. Um, can I share my Terraform cord? Yes. GitHub.com slash Mason Eggers. Oh, I don't remember where I put it. Uh, well, there's do dash community slash sample Terraform architectures. So this is a repository that I worked on a little bit and I haven't had much time to work on since. This is a minimal web DB stack. Um, so it's Terraform sample architectures. I'll drop it in the chat. And I'm gonna next year, one of my goals is to build a lot more of these, which are just sample fully fledged out Terraform tools to get this going. I probably need to update this one because I haven't tested it with the new load balancers. But um, if we go to doo -doo 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 -doo, web servers, um, and then we have like, we have our DigitalOcean certificate. That's how we set up our DNS certificate. This is how we set up our D DigitalOcean load balancer. As you can see, I copy every, I comment everything. So you can use this as an educational resource. You're also 100% welcome to just deploy this as you want. Um, forwarding rules, DigitalOcean firewalls to make sure people can't access it. The architecture this one sets up is this. So it creates a three web server, uh, thing with a database, uh, all within a VPC, HTTP only comes into the load balancer and you have to SSH into a bastion server to be able to get in. These web these web servers um, don't allow for external access. Uh, so you can't access them via their uh, droplet IP. You can only access them via the internal IP. This is done with firewall rules. DigitalOcean does not have private only IP address droplets at this time. Uh, but yes, I dropped the code in there. Next question, Terraform versus Ansible. Both. They're, they're, they're completely two different tools. Terraform is a provisioning tool. Ansible is a configuration tool. Terraform stands up my servers, gets me going, gets Ubuntu up, maybe does some very basic stuff at the very beginning, but it's there for managing my infrastructure, managing what packages installed, managing what versions of stuff are doing, what users are, are existent. I would never do that in Terraform. That's an Ansible thing. So you have, you have a classic Infrastructure as code versus configuration management. They're not enemies. They are the best of friends. They work together hand in hand and everything. The answer is both. I'm going to stop for questions real quick. We're going to finish demoing the app platform app. I'm going to talk a little bit about Kubernetes and then I'll come back to questions. We are having a lot of great questions today and I'm loving it. This is probably the most questions I think I've ever answered on a on a tech talk. And I think it's great. So let's talk about the pie. Let's go back. We were doing how does app platform do load balancing? Um, it just does it for you. That's the magic of that platform. It just does things for you. So the host name um, is ugly because it's a Docker container. But as you can see, as I'm refreshing it, it just does it. Um, that's all you have to do. You go to a pro plan. You say horizontal scaling. You add more than one container. There's nothing more you need to do for the app platform thing. Remember, app platform is just way more fully managed. Um, I know that seems like it was like maybe there should be more to that, but no, it's just, it's that simple. Just add more containers. Boom. You're done. We've taken care of all of it for you. 
it really does add some peace of mind. Uh, okay, next thing, Kubernetes. So DigitalOcean does have a Kubernetes uh, talk. And as you can see, we have like 10 minutes left. I have no time to go over this. But DigitalOcean Kubernetes does use our load balancers. So by you, this, you can set a create a configuration file to load balance, I believe with Ingress, I'm gonna say some stuff. And if I'm wrong about the Kubernetes stuff, I'm sorry, I'm not a Kubernetes expert. Um, but you create, a, you create a load balancer config file and I think it has to do something with like your Ingress, but it looks like it's, just, it's a type load balancer. Um, and you specify where everything goes. This will, this will apply it to your Kubernetes and you will see the load balancers appear in your cloud console. Like you'll see them appear. Um, they will be associated with your Kubernetes cluster. So you would uh, the way that you do a, a load balancer in DOKS or DigitalOcean Kubernetes service is the same way you do a load balancer in Kubernetes. You would just do it. Our service knows that you want a DigitalOcean load balancer and it just does it for you. So not a lot to really go over the Kubernetes part. I'm gonna go back to the questions now. Okay. Yes, and exactly. DevOps Labs got it right. Uh, can it notify you via email if your droplets are down? Yes, it can. It can also notify you via Slack. You would think that I wouldn't lose everything that I do. All the oh, did I close it? I think I closed it. Let's make sure I... So monitoring, DigitalOcean has monitoring and alerting. Uh, I can create a resource alert. I can say CPU is above so much. I can say Tech Talk. Which I can do it by droplet name or by droplet... Um, or by droplet tag, and then it can email me, and I can also have it linked to a Slack. It looks like this account's already linked to, we use, this account is what deploys our Hacktoberfest stuff. Um, and you can create this resource alert, is above, for how long, um, and then what metric, bandwidth, disk, utilization, yes. So you can get it via email, you can also get it via Slack. Great question. Uh, let's go back to the main project view. Uh, can one load balancer mo balance multiple applications or can it not differentiate between domain to forward to a different tag? Uh, one load balancer per applic per per domain. So if you're doing, or subdomain, so test dot, so tech talks dot, uh, semi dot cloud, um, that's all it can do. These load balancers don't have that ability to do uh, multiple applications. That You would get that in a much more com complex one um, or like a, a hardware load balancer, but no, you would need separate ones for different subdomains. Great question. Uh, if a droplet goes down, will the LB bring up a replacement node? No. Um, or do you bring up a replacement node systematically? No. We don't have any of that implemented or options. That would be something you would have to do on your own. So what, what I could see myself doing as we talked about the alerting, I would do like some sort of Slack bot that well, we could, you could do it as a Slack bot or an email. Um, but basically if it got that re that notification and you wanted it to do that, you could ingest the Slack message and then have another Slack bot that maybe, you know, reads it or knows what's going on. And then they could do it for you. Um, I actually have another tech talk, if you go back a couple months, on how to build Slack box in Python on DigitalOcean. So you could totally do that. But no, we do not have any, like, this is this would be considered like auto-scaling style stuff. We do not have any of that currently. Um, yes, whenever I see it happening, I whenever I see that little loading screen, I always think Baby Shark. It's hilarious. Uh... Okay, I think I already answered that question. Um, I can access your first load balancer on HTTPS, but not HTTP. Didn't you set it? Let's look. Take a look. Uh, yeah, let's each colon double dot tech talk dot sammy dot cloud. Oh, it's doing that. I know what I did wrong. I do this every time. And I don't like this. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go complain when I'm done with this. If you don't have a forwarding rule for HTTP to HTTP, it closes the port and doesn't do the forward. I make this mistake every time. In my mind, that's not intuitive. If I say that I want you to redirect it, then you should open that port for me by default. I'm going to go talk to you about it. But I think now if I try curling it. Okay, so that I think is like a 301. So it didn't fail this time. Um, HTTP colon uh, techtalk.sammy.cloud. 
There we go. And that redirected. You have to have that port open on your load balancer. I forget that every time. Thank you for bringing that up. I would have forgot. Uh, is there any way we can set up auto scaling? If a lot of track, you're going to have to do it on your own with your own stuff. Like use monitoring and metrics uh, and you're going to have to write on your own. Again, I am advocating to get you this feature. It is, it is, it is my, my, like my, whatever I'm doing, my, my Olympics, my, I'm going to die on that hill. It's what I'm doing. Uh, would it make sense to load balance at the Cloudflare level and then also at the Digital Ocean level? Uh, yes, some people use both, 100%. I've I know people that use Cloudflare uh, load balancers um, for this. I think the app platform stuff is using Cloudflare load balancers, but I'm not positive. Um, so yes, this totally could be a thing. This happens. Uh, this happens a lot. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Okay, la we're running out of questions. Great. Does it have? Does it have to load balance a subdomain or can you do a base domain? Yes, we do. We have wildcard domains. So you can do a base domain if you want. Um, we just did it as a subdomain, but there is wildcard and you can do top level domain. So it doesn't have to be a subdomain. Uh, can you doing some better square metrics? What's going on? Unfortunately, I don't have any time to do that today. I've only got four minutes, but that would have been a good one. Oh, cool. So it's doing a 307 temporary redirect now. Good. I'm glad I figured that out. Um, we are at the end of the questions. So, and we are at four minutes until I have to run away and go do other things. So if anyone has any more questions, feel free to drop. This is pretty much the end of the talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, there is one more tech talk next week. If I pull up my calendar over here where you can't see it i've gotten better about that i had a bad habit at the beginning of always showing my calendar off on streams and people were afraid of how often i was in a meeting um next week my wonderful colleague kim is doing a tech talk on automating GitOps and continuous delivery with DigitalOcean kubernetes which just sounds fantastic so if you want to come and visit that one i'll i'm sure the person backstage do you have a link for that backstage or do i need to find it so we can drop it in the chat I have a, I have a, there's a, there's a magic voice in the sky. I haven't called her that in a while, but that tells me when it's time to leave and stuff. And she handles moderation on the back end. So yes, there will be another great tech talk next week. I highly recommend that you go and attend it. Um, my, it's just one of my other developer advocates here at Digitalocean, Kim, and then my other, my other coworker, Chris, both are amazing speakers. Anytime you get the opportunity to uh, listen to them speak, I highly recommend it. Um, if you enjoyed this and you want to know more about like when I'm doing stuff, follow me on Twitter. I usually post about when I'm doing all this. If you are a fan of our weekly show called Cloud Chats, which we do on Thursday, which is kind of like our little news talk show. We play some games. We talk about stuff kind of like just developers chatting. That is coming on tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern, and it is our season finale. So this will be the last one you get for a while until we return in season two. Um, yes. We have one more question. Okay, so if load balancing in NA in Europe, is there a way to have a managed DB replicated in either region to reduce? Ooh, I don't, you are asking great questions. Um, I will ask. I do not know that off the top of my head. My Twitter handle, I will put it in the chat. It's at Mason Egger. Um, it's also, if you look at my little, uh, whenever, whenever this goes away, ah, stop. Like if you look, uh, I'll just, Ah, I'm big now. Um, if you look down here in the bottom left-hand corner, it um, it's, it has it. So at Mason Egger is where you can find me. We have two minutes. Um, but yes, this was great. I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed this. The, the questions were great. This is honestly probably like the most engaged tech talk I think I've ever done. And the questions were great. And I loved every one of them made me think about it. Um, now I want to go play with some load balancers. <laughs> I want to go do some load, load testing. I love networking. Networking is one of my favorite things. Um, and unfortunately, you have to, if you want to play with a lot of networking, you have to have, you know, a cloud account or a really big home lab. So, okay. So when I was using uh, GeoUnicorn, I had an issue when using multiple workers. It seemed like it was forgetting initialized variables. I set workers to one and it fixed the issue. Any advice? Ooh. I feel like I've seen this error before, but I don't remember what it was. Mm. We're using G-Unicorn with Fly. I will look into this. 
I I feel like I've 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 seen this before, and I feel like I have an answer for it. Go look on the DigitalOcean Q and A on our community site because I feel like that was a, a Q and A question that I answered like at the beginning of App Platform. Um, but yeah, look if you, DigitalOcean has a Q and A site that's just community, and then you just look at it's called Questions. I think community slash community slash Questions, um, and look for stuff like that. You should be able to find it, but that does look very familiar. Um, unfortunately, I am out of time for today. It has been great. This is my last tech talk of the year. So this is me signing off for now. I will be back tomorrow for our last cloud chats, and then I will be gone for a while, taking a nice uh, little break. But thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for attending uh, this tech talk. And it's great. As always, it's great seeing you. So I will see you either tomorrow at cloud chats. And if I don't see you tomorrow at cloud chats, I will see you next year with a whole new set of tech talks and interesting things to talk about. Have a good day, everyone.